Welcome to this episode of Rattling the Bars. Reading among slaves have always been banned and forbidden, and now we find that reading in prison is also being banned and curtailed. Alex Snowbick has written an article and has investigated this, and he's joining me today to tell us what's happening with books in prison. Alex, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. Atlas, can you just give us an overview of what's happening in the prison industrial complex in general? Yeah, absolutely. So I first started investigating this when I read some reports coming out of Iowa that the Department of Corrections there had banned donations of books completely from outside parties. So that's charities, that's family members, like nobody can send books into prison now there. And that's, the more I dug, the more I realized that's happening in states all over the country. And they're making it harder and harder to get reading material from anywhere. Okay. Uh, it's it's um, some 50 years ago when I was in prison in the Maryland Penitentiary, uh, when I arrived there, there was like uh, 4,000 people in the area that I was housed in. And there was no library. Uh, there was no library in the whole penitentiary in all the other housing areas. And we actually created a library. We uh, took two cells and got people to send us books in and we built a library. It embarrassed the prison and they eventually, the government actually funded a library. And uh, right, then, and this was like 1971. So I thought I thought about it then, and I realized that prison officials don't want prisoners to read. And, and why is that? Well, in a lot of cases, what I found is that it's a a lot to do with the profit model in prisons. That these prisons are run for profit in a lot of states, and so their incentive is to keep people coming back and to keep recidivism up. And so if you read, you know, you may educate yourself, you may get out of the cycle. So they want to take that opportunity away and keep the profit line, basically. Okay, that uh, uh, contributes to recidivism greatly uh, because like eight out of 10 people end up back in the prison system within a year and a half. Uh, but you also pointed out in your article that there is a, a, a another ulterior motive in terms of the profit uh, system, in terms of big book manufacturing distributors. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So this is one of the more kind of sinister aspects of it now is that when they ban donations and they ban a lot of the ways of getting books, they'll leave one or two retailers. And usually it's big companies like Amazon, big companies like Barnes and Noble, and they'll leave them as the approved vendors, they call them, and charge the full retail price, full markup, like just price gouge completely the people held captive it's a literal captive market okay um and it seems like this there's, there's also some stuff around ebooks and uh global tech and can you talk about that a little bit because that seems kind of scary and i'm, I'm sure it's probably used in the federal systems and in other places that use emails Yes, yes. So th that's one of the newer developments is that things are bad with physical books, like the old fashioned kind, but they're, if anything, even worse with ebooks because there's this one company in particular called Global Tell Link. And mm -hmm. in a lot of states, they will provide what are supposedly free tablets for people to read on. But the catch is always that the content itself is charged for, and they 
don't sell an ebook as like a one time purchase. They actually charge by the minute to read. So every time you open your book, you've got a, a register running up money. And mm. Mm. Somebody, did, somebody did the math on this and it, I believe, I believe it's five cents a minute to read, which it doesn't sound like much, but when you consider that mm. the wage in prison could be 25 cents an hour or less, like it's days and days of people's wages. So. Yeah, and if you're a slow reader like me, uh, it it would take me five minutes to read a page or two. Yeah, yeah um, and it dis- and it, it discourages stopping to think and reflect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, how do how do how do the prison system justify these bans? All of a sudden, books are dangerous. Uh, how how do they justify that? Yeah, so the it, it's really interesting. The language they use in a lot of places, like in, in Michigan especially, I dug into the law, and the language they use is that supposedly the books are could could be used to bring in dangerous contraband, they say. Like they they will go as far to say as like there could be drugs in the books, there could be weapons. And it's it's a really flimsy justification because they can't hardly ever point to a case of this happening they just bring up the fear that it might Mm -hmm. the old uh, hacksaw in the cake kind of scenario from the wild west okay um when actually everybody realizes and especially people that's been in the prison system realize that most of the contraband is brought in by the guards yeah. Most of the contraband is brought in because the guards can be rich. I mean, be enriched. Um, and and so it might be in their interest to ban things that they'll have to end up bringing in surreptitiously. Um, I'm, I'm wondering because it seems like, and in, in looking at your article, it seems like there's a racial disparity uh, in um, what books are allowed in and what books are banned. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there there absolutely is. It's a flagrantly racist system, and they're, they're not even trying to hide it, really. Like, even in in prisons that don't even have the, the blanket bans on bringing books in, they'll have what are called content-specific bans, and it's a certain title or a certain author that is said to be inflammatory. And it is like virtually always a black author that's targeted. It's people like Angela Davis, people like Elijah Muhammad are on the ban list. And even things like Mein Kampf are not, which is mm-hmm. like not even subtle. Mm-hmm. That's, that's like Hitler's Bible, right? Yeah. Oh. Uh, and oh, I, I noticed you mentioned the Turner Diary, and uh, uh, it should be mentioned because it's one of the most racist, horrible kind of books you could pick up uh, that leads to a lot of violence against people of color. Uh, and that's not banned. No, that's, uh, allowed, that's allowed. And books about like crime in white communities are allowed, but it's, it's along the racial line that they target this stuff. Mm, 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 mm. So, uh, how how widespread is this? Uh, you pointed out a few states, uh, uh, and I know it's also probably in the Federal Bureau of Prisons also. Uh, how widespread is this ban? Is it growing? Is there resistance? Is there pushback? What? Yeah, it's... It's scarily widespread. It's like way more than I expected when I first started researching this. It's Iowa is the latest state, but there are dozens. There's Michigan, there's Pennsylvania, there's things in Washington. And there had the good news is there has been resistance. And some of these states, like uh, Pennsylvania, for example, have been forced to roll back the policies after people made noise about it. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what, what, you know, the, the, the one thing that, that I thought was important, I mean, the whole entire time I was in prison, I read 
and it, it was very vital to me. Um, what's the, the 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 loss of the ability to read at your leisure and stop and think and 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 have multiple choices? What kind of impact you think that will have on the prisoners? Oh, I think it's going, if it's not reformed and if these policies aren't checked, it's going to be devastating for people because like we can look at pretty much any memoir of somebody who was in prison. Like I looked at um, Malcolm X's memoir, or Eldridge Cleaver's, even in your own book, Martial Law, like the solace that people get from books like is one of the most important things for them to educate themselves and liberate themselves and be able to understand the system they're in and stand up to it. And not come back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I honestly, uh, uh, certainly the support of thousands of people helped me survive my ordeal, but had it not been for books, I don't think I would have survived because books played an equally important role as people outside did. Uh, because the times I couldn't get to people outside, I had the book. I had something that gave me comfort or at least gave me agency. Uh, so that it's kind of, you know, it, it, it concerns me that this is happening. What can people do um, about this? Yeah, there are there are a few things people can do. The maybe the most important is to just educate themselves on what is going on in there. Because the biggest, I think, weapon that the administrators and the wardens have is that this issue is just kept out of sight for most of the population. Like so many people don't even realize this is going on. So education, hugely important. Getting in contact with people behind bars. There are groups that send books in and help to facilitate things like that. I wrote about the Appalachian Prison Book Project as one, um, Books Through Bars, um, a lot of different groups like that that are doing the work. And, you know, we can always use more of those groups. So people need to just get informed and get in contact and get organized, really. And I guess my feeling is, and I, I go back to slavery, obviously that's part of a long history that I share with my ancestors. Um, and I always realized that the most dangerous thing in the world uh, for the slave owners was a slave that was reading. Um, and you know, and we talk about the 13th Amendment and we talk about how that exception clause for being locked up and convicted means you can be uh, held in slavery. Uh, and it seems to me now with oh, two plus million people in this system, it seems like there's a, a concerted effort to bring back slavery in all its forms, not just the work. But the the you know in in fact you talked a little bit about it in your article about rehabilitation. There's there's no sense of rehabilitation at all as far as I can see. Talk can you talk a little bit about that? You did point out the vice president is like a, a component of that. Talk about how they are framing this prison system and yet it's doing exactly the opposite. Yeah, so the the rehabilitation thing is is really key there because that's a lot of the times the story or the lie really that's used to justify these systems and even the name penitentiary it sounds like it's a place to be penitent and reform and like change your life but in reality that's not what's going on at all. And in fact, that kind of reform and like reassessment is a threat to the system because it'll get people out of it eventually. And you know, it's so ingrained in American society that like, yeah, both parties, like even our vice president, like it has a history of 
just working to maintain this system and, and make sure that it's never questioned. So really anything we can do to question the basic logic of it is, goes a long way. All right, then, Alex, thanks for joining me. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me. Okay, and thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.